rather like everything else we've done in ethos over the last 23 years over the last 15 years um it's continual experimentation continuous innovation you know let's do something and learn by doing it so we started a um a podcast uh 23 weeks ago and that that's just like explosive gone from strength to strength really really pleased with that and so now we we want to do a webinar so um at the moment this this channel will give us about 150 people simultaneously and that will grow we're going to do this every week on thursdays at um 12 o'clock and for people um uh west of us the american folk we're going to do it at four o'clock as well so that you know thursday 12 o'clock thursday four o'clock uh people can choose you know when to come into it is have a few um, ground rules and they're they're really quite simple I'll, I'll i'll go through them but these rules you know can be changed like anything else in ethos but we have found that when you get 150 people in the room and you say um make it up as you go along without any you know it, it can get bloody it can get really really messy um so you know it, it's kind of necessary to just just pause for a tiny moment and go look here's some ethos you know it's lowercase e of of how we propose running these meetings it's like music often the pause is uh what you listen to ah okay jeez give me permission what's going on <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you like to stand up, do a star jump, whatever you want. <laughs> okay, so in these hours every week, they will be different and they will be owned by the community that we're facilitating. As I say, we plan to rapidly get up to 150 people, and there's some all sorts of whizzy bang exciting technology things about pushing people into breakout rooms and having guest speakers and giving you all opportunities to do your amazing things. I mean, can I just ask Annabelle? So Annabelle and Rob are your facilitators. So Annabelle, would you be okay and go, you know, hello, I'm Annabelle and just introducing yourself. We won't do it with everyone, but we will get everyone to speak. Yeah, obviously I have the advantage of having met every single person in the room previously, but so so not to bore everybody, but I, I've worked uh, with Rob uh, and Tony uh, for the last 20, well, it'll be 25 years in October, um, 24 years, but on, on this particular version of um, uh, Ethos for the last uh, 15 years, I think, 15 years maybe, um, um, and I, I, I'm, I've always been about people. I mean, we started, you know, our journey thinking that community was the answer to everything um, 25 years ago and have still sort of retained that thread, I think. And for, for me, it's about putting people back at the center of uh, what they're doing. I feel I'm on a mission of, I mean, awakening sounds like a, a, a nerdy, thing to say but uh, I, I feel I want people to understand that they can feel empowered they can do something differently they can change what they think and it's not easy I'm not saying it's easy but I really feel that if we decide you know everything that is is is, is constructed by us you know we, we we've constructed all this we, we were just an animal on a planet <laughs> at one point uh and everything that we've done we, we constructed therefore we can change and we can reconstruct uh or deconstruct or whatever we need to do uh i don't i don't, would never claim to have any of the answers uh I, 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 at all but but i i, I this so that's what i'm about and we have started this journey 23 years ago we started building communities at the time then 15 years ago we did it again and actually this but so much happened uh, in the last particularly three four years i feel the world has in some ways caught up uh, a lot uh, but has, still has masses miles to go and then the climate crisis is burning us to death so um many things to to deal with but but I feel feel optimistic that we have opportunity to to do that if we can, you know, convene people around real problems in an in a kind and people centered way, where we sort of you know do our best to get rid of uh, you know uh, the things that we don't want to experience through our work, uh, and that's different for everybody, um, of course, you know, which adds to the complexity. It's not easy, but that's that's me, and that's what I'm I'm about and my mission really. Um, so I'm Rob, Rob Pye, everybody knows me, um, but 
you don't know each other, which is quite interesting. Um, because Ian, who's unknown, Ian, un Ian Unknown is actually Ian Johnson. Um, and um, uh, we, we haven't worked together for, 20, you know, for 23 years. We did used to work together a long time ago in a small team of management consultants in, in EY. And the third founder, Tony's not here today, uh, was was one of those and and it was the the birth and boom of the generalization of the internet and we would we were running around like headless chickens doing silly things all over the world and um within one organization and many organizations there was just always the same group of people getting stuff done it it wasn't the process or roles or you know we had to jump over those hoops and being a geek and a techno optimist, I saw this birth of the internet as the great leveler that would perhaps unite everybody to, to do common sense things. Um, and we set up about creating this company called C People, Letter C, um, for collaborate, for community. And it, it was the pre-runner to Ethos 23 years ago. And we've been working on these experiments ever since that almost feels like what we're doing now we've actually been working our way towards for 23 years because we've never done it out loud. We've always done it in little, little closed, you know, group of employees of Ethos. There have been 150 of us and we've had this different experiments, you know, all get in a room and, you know, work it out yourself. As I say, it ended quite in, in bloodbaths. So we're kind of, we're learning how to do this collaboration, trust, moderation um, up to a point where, the pandemic hit and we did an experiment with um, young unemployed people where we had 65 uh, people, two of them here to today, so Hale and Joel, where we just employed 65 people and, you know, just get everyone to say hello to each other in a minute um, and get got them to define their jobs and their roles. And over a period of two or three years, you know, they were in control of their careers, their jobs, their, you know, and we paid them a, a a crap um, wage, you know, a basic income, a minimum wage, because um, we had some grants and we had some savings. We didn't have money to pay them well, and we didn't have jobs for life, but it did give people a couple of year or two's work experience. Um, and it transformed us so much to say, well, this isn't this isn't about creating a community of old people, young people, rich people. It's, it's actually all people, every person that we've ever worked with, when you unpick it and um, you get down to this point of social value and social justice, because anybody who's a, a son, a brother, a friend, a, well, you know, these are, we believe, um, universal truths that come out when you actually get inside the person rather than the process. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the journey we're on. Um, so yeah, my name's Joel. Um, I was working at Ethos since 2020 till around I guess a year ago is when my time at Ethos ended and yeah when I first started at Ethos I was kind of working on some of our projects um it's just doing like project work and then ended up kind of getting into the recruitment side of things with Ethos um so like interviewing people and stuff like that and at the start of it I was like really nervous <laughs> um just talking to people <clears throat> and in the interviews I wouldn't say very much at all um, but I wanted to improve on it. Um, so they gave me a chance to just like keep continuing and developing my skills. And then um, at some point during my journey at Ethos, I was like leading the interviews and in charge of like training other people how to do interviews and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it was a, because, a really because of the pandemic, we, we had like in one or two weeks, we had 2000 applicants. And the only way you could do that is not be a 57 year old, but you give it to Joel or Sahel and go, look, look, talk to all these people, you know, and, and, and offer you know, 65 of them a job. And um, just just wonderful, wonderfully organic with a tiny bit of help to make sure the process didn't fall over. Thank you. So, Hale, did you hear, hear any of that? Do you want to just say hello? Oh, um, I, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, just, so uh, just, just, we're just talking about a little bit about young leaders and um, tell us about your journey, you know, into ethos, where you are now, what you're doing, what your background was, just just in a two couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so for myself, um, I was finishing my master's in computer science. I had a, another 
I forgot what the scheme was called, the government scheme that I got. Uh, involved, kick, kick, so. Kickstart, yeah. Kickstart, yeah. So um, I had a one beforehand, but unfortunately that didn't work out. So um, I was just looking around for something to do, like kind of part time while I was finishing my dissertation. Uh, I managed to run into the ESOS on, I think, Indeed, applied, um, and then got involved uh, with the tech side of things. And then through that, I was able to, I think, kind of build on my inter uh, communication skills, like um, kind of people uh, reaching out and stuff, being able to kind of handle various projects and uh, also like what Joel was doing. So kind of be involved with like the hiring process and kind of also you'd have the, we'd have like mental health meetings. So it's like you'd have a one-to-one -one with someone who'd been assigned to you. And so just kind of doing that, I think it quite helped. Uh, not obviously helping just the people I was working with, but like myself, because I think it helped me get a better grasp on how to deal with it in a professional environment. So, um, yeah, so for myself, I think it around, ended around, I think, June last year, my time with the ESOS. And then uh, after that, it was just waiting around to find a job. Uh, fortunately enough, I found one through a grad scheme, uh, worked there for a few months, and then managed to get basically my dream job uh, luckily um it's uh, making an ultimate frisbee video game so i got my master's in game development and i played ultimate frisbee during university so it's like the perfect kind of worlds combined so um yeah i've been there for the last few months uh and yeah i'm really enjoying it i'm getting to like Make learn unreal up. yeah and uh improve my uh, programming skills so it's putting me on track for like what i want to be doing for my uh, career so yeah, wonderful. So been, uh, Thank you. So, I mean, whether you know, we had ex offenders, we had you know, people involved in drug dealing, we had master's degree people, we had you know, just it was a very, very mixed cohort. Uh, just quick introductions from the you know, Catherine, Ian, Jude. Do you want to, um, Catherine, do you want to kind of go next? Yeah, so I kind of stumbled across Ethos probably about 10 years ago thinking about it and worked with you for about a year again, I think, from memory on all sorts of weird and wonderful bits of project. My background is generally health, social care, education, charity. Um, my last role was uh, working for Norwood, a Jewish charity in Hendon, running their children and family services. Um, I think I bring a slightly weird and eclectic mix uh, to this table. I think uh, I think it's really interesting to think about issues like access because again historically the the service users and the people who I've been wanting to work with uh, you know probably don't even have access to Google Meet and, and uh, a video at the moment so I, I think it's always that mindful that you know actually we're all carrying a degree of privilege and actually real life is re still really really important and we need to find imaginative and effective ways of of actually meeting people where they're at because lots of people yeah. aren't here and, and uh, we uh, talked to one of the officers in essex uh you know mm. who's a friend and you know we said right tell us exactly what you know why this digital exclusion is a problem you know where mm. where you know surely everyone has a phone everyone has google Meet, mm. everyone and, and she spent quite a while in bringing texture to that to really yeah. in our face tell us you yeah. know this lack of tech People, yeah. there are lots of people who don't have it. You know, really, yeah. really incredible. Um, oh, we've lost Ian. Uh, Jude, do you want to um, quit? Hello. Sure. Um, yes, I guess uh, perhaps similar to Catherine, I just uh, greatly enjoyed uh, meeting you both and uh, working on a, a small project with you. Um, uh, we probably won't get into the names of those, but. Uh, yeah, just I, I think my engagement um, or, or reason for sort of uh, being incorporated into that mix is just someone who's got a very um, diverse career to a point that it is actually sort of problematic sometimes of trying to categorize or market myself. Um, and but but nonetheless, I sort of I think I retain a sort of curiosity in sort of fringe projects. Um, and you know sort of inclusivity for me i see it almost as a bit of a sort of strategic tool that that often by working in the fringe or in a place that takes a lot of empathy or fresh research to understand i, I truly sort of believe through experience that it ends up benefiting the whole organization for the better so um for me it's not just a sort of you know doing good which of course is great 
it, it's that I genuinely think teams emerge stronger and more capable as a result of of being in the vanguard or just being out of their comfort zone on a on a daily basis, not just on a special work retreat once a year for a week. So so I think that that's where I get my kicks. Uh, that's why I'm excited to be here. Um, and uh, as you said, suspend judgment. That that is. Uh, I, I come with an agenda of uh, wanting to sort of understand certain things, um, but but at the same time, open-minded to see where this takes us. So, thanks. Yeah, sure. I'll try and keep it short, but uh, great here, long story. So, um, started in IT, I uh, got to IT director, realized I didn't like IT that much. Um, moved into the process re-engineering world for a while, joined EY, met Rob Pye. Um, did a whole load of project and program management stuff. Then and, we, and we haven't. Ian's actually the only one I think we haven't worked with for 23. Is it? So, the, you know, he's, he's he's one of the fortunate ones that escaped, um, <laughs> escaped my influence, you know, one of the few. I just slippery. That's all it is. Um, so, yeah, and then then got went into the organisational change, culture change bit of EY um and so that basically gives me people process and technology kind of all all in so i i ended up using that in in order to make significant changes and address gnarly problems in big organizations um i did a, along the way i did a doctorate in organizational change uh using complexity theory as the kind of lens through which to look at it and um our, my cv looks a lot like the fca's biggest fines i i hasten to add it wasn't my fault i went in there to try and fix them afterwards so i've got things like barclays rbs standard chart and so on on there so yes big gnarly problems cultural issues all that kind of stuff um and my focus from given this is social value my focus for the last 15 years has been financial crime so working with the banks to help identify criminals and take them off the streets there you go what a what a punchline to finish with mark do you just just want to want to say say hello oh and take yourself off mute yeah i mean you can say hello on mute and that would be <laughs> an interesting introduction but Hello, yeah, so my name is Mark Waters. So um, my background is education. So I spent in the first 25 years working with kids, mainly with problems in schools, in the community, school units, did loads of vocational education, alternative provision, um, worked in Knowsley, local authority for 14 years on what was called key stage four engagement. So kids who were having trouble in schools, going out to work with trained providers and colleges, uh, got frustrated with that, ended up going to do uh, after 25 years of doing my degree, went to Institute of Education in London to do a mass research based masters, looking at the provision we had had since the 1963 Newsom report, all our futures, half our futures, um, the kind of provision we'd had for kids who were not engaged in academic study and, you know, were being switched off by education. And what I found was we had a program, a process of every five to eight years. We just change education. Usually when we get a new um, uh, government and they hit, oh, we've got a problem with needs. We've got a problem with skills. We've got a problem with engagement. So let's have a new scheme. So they go in a dark room, shut the door and reinvent the scheme. You know, uh, so we had um, the TVI project. We had the diploma project program I worked on with Labour government. Uh, we then bring in GMVQs. We bring in BTEX and then we get... Um, Mr. Gove comes along, wipes the slate clean. We're going back to good academic qualifications, good rigor. And then this morning, I was driving to this primary school in Mould near where I live, and they're on there. Oh, we, I think we need a new way of uh, a new a, a new kind of qualification system because this isn't working for a lot of young people, you know. And I was just pulling my hair out. And then as part of that project, I researched. I worked with a group of younger apprentices who had had horrendous times in school. And life and yet we we're really incredibly successful and the two that changed my completely changed my life was two guys from uh jamie Oliver's 15 oliver's 15 program who i sat down one seven o'clock one morning in the restaurant they were doing their apprentice chef project and they completely changed my view on everything i did for the past 25 years 
and I'm still in touch with one guy now who is uh, head chef at Google in London, having at 14 been locked up for attempted murder and running a big gang in South London, you know. Um, so yeah, so I've done different projects. Then about five years ago, I uh, went to see a, a guy I kind of knew, half knew, but I knew I thought I'd be able to work with him. So this is Phil Atkinson at Daresbury Labs uh, near Warrington. So his day job is building particle accelerators for CERN and Fermilab and she, in, around the world. He's got a six billion pounds worth of project. And he started at 15 as an apprentice at Daresbury Labs near Liverpool. You know, so I went to see him with the idea of setting up a charity that had a clear focus on how we can empower young people to understand and prepare for a world that is dramatically changing mm -hmm. due to the impact of digital technology innovation. You know, so this was five years ago. So this is uh, industry for the internet, the internet of things, you know, obviously Jack AI has now kicked off big time over the past year. So Phil loved the idea. So in, after a while, we, we were able to set the charity up. So we now run a whole load of projects what, on what we call journeys. So we're a careers education charity, not a STEM charity. And we use things like um, going to Mars, you know, how, why are we going to Mars? How are we going to get there? What impact is it going to have on the human body? Then how can you construct something on a planet millions of miles away? So we did that kind of project pre-COVID, which was really successful. Where, you know, the last big workshop we did before COVID was 10 days before COVID at Manchester uh, University with 100 young people from five academies, from five really challenging academies, Salford, Manchester, where I grew up. Um, and that is a web, there's a web uh, video on our website, which, and it was incredible. Then 10 days after that, COVID hit. Shit, what we're going to do? And we're a tiny charity, two, two employees and Phil and a few trustees and, and uh, supporters. So we started doing some webinars, which went really well. So we've got people from the space industry to do our work with us on our Callum project. And I came up with Valum, visualizing a life on Mars. And that's how we've used drawings, paintings, comic books, music, video, film models to visualize space travel. And we'd had 90 to 100 um 10 and 11 year olds logging on every morning you know and then jason my colleague who does all our 3d visualization stuff uh, created a virtual mars gallery that you could uh, go in and explore and put the kids working there with professional artists so we did that so we've done loads of space projects now and another big area is sustainability are creating a sustainable life on earth so that takes some people on a journey of what are the challenges we're facing what is being done about it electric cars, renewable energy, um, alternative to plastics. But the key bit of it is who's working on this. And, in, and throughout your future career, whatever it is, whether you're a game designer, a hairdresser, a fashion designer, a coder, an engineer, a scientist, a lawyer, a farmer, an architect, you can still work on helping to address these challenges. Substance, I promised that we would just put our collective minds to um is uh um so we've done number one and we're going to now rattle through number two which is a substantive bit of the uh show and workshop social value social justice what, are they, what do they even mean Did, would anybody like to um help us through the definitions before i do a little bit of um uh <clears throat> uh, Wikipedia research on this. Anybody want to do social value? What is it? What's the, what is the definition that comes to mind? Are you talking from a kind of personal or a corporation, a company's point of view? That's a brilliant question. Um, I, I don't know if I even know the answer. I, to I, that, I think that my, intuitively, I think individual is where I would head from. I think then whatever you do in your daily life or your job what contribution are you, are you making to society to society yeah you know and, and long, I, I, long term I think, long term so you've I, got I, this thing of yeah we're making loads of money um you know or we're making you know we we develop this new product one of the things that i've learned from working with phil is unintended consequences so all these things these great new innovations and great alternatives to plastic you then find out an alternative to plastic um, straws are paper straws, which are full of forever chemicals, which are quite toxic, you know? And do, does anyone who work in this world ever think of the, the further impact on society of what they're doing? And if they don't know, should they be doing it? You don't blindly just make something and send it off into the world 
I said, well, it's better than that, but oh shit. Absolutely. Two years later, we find out it's, you know, it's having this impact or, you know, big one we're working, we come across recently, we know is, yeah, electric cars are great, but where are we getting the lithium from the batteries? These poor little eight year olds digging it up in mines and they're dying, they, you know, so is that something? Anyway. Anybody else want to build build on Mars? I'm very inspired by, by that, very close to my heart. Um, anybody want to say anything else on that? I love the fact you answered the question with a question first. Do you mean individually? Do you mean yeah. corporately? Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> uh, anybody else? Me about redistribution of kind of power and resources and something else, because that brings in the justice that mm -hmm. we can add value. But if the value is defined by us and held by us, then actually we're not hitting the justice mark. But it is about taking power away from potentially ourselves and, and handing over power and resources to other people. Um, particularly so that they can determine their lives in a meaningful way. Beautiful. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, I think uh, also like with the social value, rather than thinking of it big picture with like companies and stuff, it's like more of on a personal level. So it's like how, rather than thinking how your job bring changes, it's like how you as a person can just bring more positivity in the uh, to like, society so it's like if you see obviously an old woman crossing the road or something like that it's like how certain actions i think that's kind of on a personal level enables us to move forward as well because i think if you're able to in ingest it into the younger generations and uh as people are growing up they'll be able to take them values and of uh hopefully spread them and then that's uh, obviously will hopefully have an impact for the future because if these people are taking these values into consideration as a kid it's going to be more ingrained in them when they're older and then it's like when they get into the power they'll be able to push this and enable it to be passed down to future generations so yeah okay so let, let's just draw a line under under that i won't i won't go any any more but um i, I did a workshop uh, not so long ago for the um uh one of the big central government departments to their social value ambassadors and we went down the same avenue of you know it's kind of like personally what does it mean rather than institutionally and it you know it crashed it was kind of like well i'm you know it's a network of social value ambassadors for central government who had no visceral personal emotional you know help an old lady cross a road you know what do i do in my job no individual attachment to that and i think that's that's why our mission is it's like social value how do you do the personal bit if you get it if you get it personally you can help others if you don't if you think that social value is something you do to others because you're privileged you kind of like no you know anybody got a mum a dad anybody ever had a mum and dad anybody got a friend anybody ever had a job you know anybody helped ever like we right so then i was doing a bit, tiny bit of prep for this workshop uh, which I never do because I kind of like winging it. Um, and um, this is not sharing. This is not doing what I'm expecting. So um, I don't know. You should use Zoom it's much better than all these crappy. Oh, stop it. Um, so <laughs> I'll go to this. So then what I found um, without getting to platform wars um, is that, that Wikipedia, which is our sort of gospel, you, probably can't see that for you know definitions and you know got you know when I googled social value I got a um, disambiguation page which says are you talking about value as in value uh, ethical definition or are you talking about the UK's Public Services Act uh, Social Value Act 2012 it's like no i'm talking about what we've just talked about now i'm talking about social value so our first job is to rewrite this page on wikipedia for heaven's sake we don't even have a page on wikipedia that can help us you know we've got some well this might actually be talking about value in uh, social sciences context so if we click through to that there's a lot of good stuff about the definition of value as in non-economic you know societal anthropological exchange of value um which is really really cool um but but it isn't social value social value is mentioned if you if you kind of go you know uh, search for social in there you can see that there are there is a mention um 
of it, social values in the plural, um, and and it's very relevant. But but it is you know we 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 go to a an act of parliament, which is Mark Waters' corporate if you're a government definition of get 10% on your procurement by doing stuff that you know can often be greenwashing. So then we would kind of look beyond that and go to a charity like the Shaw Trust, who's quite a famous, you know, Scottish charity that does social value and go, look, look here's a here's a simple value, a simple definition. Um, social value about the well-being of current and future generation cover three different areas. Social, the well-being of individuals and communities. So, you know, Mark, you know, Sahail, beautiful economic. You know that social justice bit, Catherine, that you sort of talked about the economic leveling and environmental. And I love the fact that it's kind of like social value. Let, let's actually consider the ecosystem at writ large as um, a, a, a something that we need to ensure the well-being, not just of the um, uh, carbon, which we just talk about, but but what about the natural world? What about all of the um, living organisms in the world and the well-being of plants and creatures and species that we kind of look at the bigger ecosystem. Um, but I, I would suggest that, you know, by the next week we get a draft up on Wikipedia of social value um, and go, look, you were here and we were quite horrified that when we started running a workshop and talked about this, we didn't even have, you know, and it's like, that's a good starting point, perhaps. Um, I think social justice is more of a slam dunk, um, and and I think um, Catherine, you um, you you were there in your uh, definitions on on that social justice in relation to the fair balance in the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privilege uh, within a society where individuals' rights are recognised and protect, protected. In Asian cultures, the concept of social justice often referred to the process of ensuring that individuals fulfil their societal roles and receive their uh, uh, due from society and I, and I think that despite the fact that transnationally socio-economically we are going to see very very different definitions that I would posit a hypothesis that we will all boil down to um, people and planet well-being at the end of the day if we unpick these things wherever we are in the world whatever our societal norms or mores or whatever are that when he boils down to it you ask people about who they are you know it, it, it's you're going to get some bits about looking after one another and and maybe not waiting for a natural disaster that um wipes out twenty thousand people in order for warring political parties across different sides of a country to stop shooting each other as is happening today in Libya, you know, the great unification of a society being mass extinction of uh, a large number. Um, okay, so uh, that was, I think, uh, just a provocation um, that I wanted to broadcast and ask people what you thought of that. Um, quiet silence, Pippa. The first thing that struck me was looking at the the three kind of definite sub definitions of social value is that when you think about what they mean they all come back to the first one in the end particularly if you define individuals as not just human beings is that they all come back to the first sorry what what was so the first one uh hang on i did do a quick screen grab while you had it up there the well-being of individuals and communities yeah yeah yeah, if, yeah. the whole lot of, so when you think about economic or environmental it still comes back to those um the other thing the other thing that also strikes me um, social value I think often gets thought of in terms of the things we're delivering and the things that we're creating and so on. And what's, what's sometimes missed is the things that we, the way in which we constrain, because sometimes not doing stuff or stopping 
someone from being able to go down a particular road is the thing that has the most value in terms of the well-being for the wider set of individuals. I, I think that is such a powerful point, Ian, that it's so powerful. I've, I've, I've drafted just set of what we've learned in ethos, this idea of moderation, that what would the world look like if we didn't always strive for more in an unlimited mm. way in gdp economically you know possessions um, power wealth whatever but actually in some areas of our life you know we recognize as mark was you know talking about the the supply chain uh, you know the extraction uh, etc and that we 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 looked at bits of our life where less is more what would i like to do less and, and again you know if we go east and to um, um eastern philosophies in buddhism or elsewhere in the world but less is more is a you know, it's a legitimized you know but but in established western liberal democracy we kind of just we don't think about it but we go back what well, okay more it's obviously better um really uh, wonderful point jude you, you got your hand up well it's just uh i was just trying to you know not not, not sort of interject and talk over so yeah um I guess I guess maybe a link that I, I thought I'd contribute uh, to the discussion is uh, the power manual, how to master complex power dynamics. Um, it's a book that um, I, I was recommended by someone I sort of reached out to on Twitter as I was basically struggling around a lot of these issues that we've been discussing. And, and I guess it sort of encapsulates by the the phrase of the um, the road to hell is path with is paved with good intentions. And I feel that, that that's often the, the, the dilemma that I hit um, working with companies sooner or later, or whether it's conscious or subconscious, um, is that I think most people are motivated by good. I, I am sort of an optimist, whether it's with tech and AI or whether it's with charitable causes or ESG goals, these sorts of things. But, but often in doing that, as as Mark alluded to earlier, with something even as innocuous as straws, it, it's actually more complicated than most people realize. Um, and if you consider that we struggle to get straws or paper bags versus plastic bags right, then actually running an entire multinational company uh, with supply chains that span the world, suddenly suddenly you realize it gets very complicated very quickly. Um, and, and I think even you mentioned the sort of East meets West in terms of philosophical points. I think, it, you know, we spend a lot of time with the, the narcissism of small differences, uh, you know, of that we, we either spend a lot of time dividing ourselves and pointing out how one group is significantly disaffected than the other, but at the same time, it feels like also forgetting the things which are universal and that most people get out of bed, try to advance, themselves, their kids, <laughs> you know, all along very similar lines. And so I, I sort of feel that um, I realize I'm waffling a little bit, but it's it's really saying I think the discipline of the work is almost trying to find the common ground and, dare I say it, not trying to always be over ambitious and save the world and save the planet in one shot. It, it, it really does feel like the biggest changes I've seen have been trying to actually sort of not bite off more than you can chew as a company, um, and that's not to be not to be m m sort of overly short-sighted or unambitious. I think it's just trying to take on a, a colossal agenda. Nearly always, just ends up in hand wringing platitudes and doesn't really go anywhere. Um, sorry if that sounds cynical. That's just my experience. Maybe some people have done it better, but but I think it's 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 really the focus that I feel has given me the greatest satisfaction working with companies on these things. Yeah, and I I think I think that there's a there's another friend that you know we haven't worked with him for years and years called John Caswell who wrote a he's a graphic artist with a particularly powerful piece on Medium a couple of uh, days ago. You can find it on LinkedIn or we can share the link, but. Um, it, he, it, you know, there is a, there's a line in that which, you know, which is the sort of the small versus the bigger, you know, versus the sort of world piece. But, but the small is, you know, I am one individual. What can I do? And then then it sort of, you know, semicolon says seven billion people. So that the common the common ground is actually how the the how common as Annabelle's just put the link to it there. 
how common the narrative is east versus west you know however we articulate that when when we get when we get down underneath what what would people like to see more of less of uh, for other people coming in for yourself coming again at one time over the next you know come next month next week next month next year we're, we're going to start inviting more people to these sessions uh what 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 could you help how could you help with the agenda uh jude again hand up very politically correct oh sorry i thought um gi given our uh email back and forth i just wondered whether it was a useful point to to discuss um and this is much for my um understanding of what of, of what the agenda is here so, so it's, a, it's a clarifying question but but how much of the intent of these sessions is uh, as i sort of called it matchmaking that you know we have people who have capabilities and experience and 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 i'm trying to be upfront without sounding like too much of a hack by saying i'm still a consultant i'm i'm an individual i my, my time is how i make my money um, and I'm sure a lot of other people are the same way. And so I, I find the best way to realize all these an, a, ambitions and good intentions is ultimately to build it into my to my work and, and sort of add value that way. Um, at the same time, I do have a hunger and a, and a commitment to also step back and use these sessions of discussion and debate and discourse to challenge my preconceptions. And it may not lead to consultation and work straight away. So I'm just wondering, could you could you calibrate my expectations? And indeed, anyone else, feel free to provoke uh, me or challenge me. <laughs> so I I think what we've what what our approach is, you know, Annabelle and I need to earn a living from the things that we do in in pretty similar way that you do by outing our self interest and being very honest and transparent about you know actually. I'd like to meet somebody who could just like not put me through a competition process, but go, Jude, you, you know, I've got this. Could you help with that? You know, and that that's often how it works. But um, what we're 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 setting, if you like, a hurdle and a bar that we all agree that the common ground individually for us to contribute is social value. And that's that's kind of like, OK, I'll help you. You help me, you know, et cetera. Now. Um, you know, on the education bit for, for Mark, the, the value uh, exchange um, uh, podcast that went out yesterday is a guy that we know called Lord Jim Knight. You know, he's a very sen senior educationist, reformist who, you know, I, I think can offer Mark, you know, and he's in he's in the commons. He's in the if you go to commons.ethosvo, which is a resource owned by the world not owned by ethos um it that kind of matchmaking i think jude is is one that would be fantastic not for him because he's education and he's like but for mark you know small charity you know th these th it's just a cambrian like explosion for joel to meet you or for sahel to meet you know it's like you that is that is you know so so you give and you get the agenda of this is not to provide a matchmaking shop. No, it's not. That's not the model. Um, but Annabelle and I would like to meet our Lord Jim Knight, and it may, you know, or or Jude or Joel, whoever that. And we don't. We we're not we're not putting these together to to for that to be the platform. But we are. So we've got a common language, which is social value, social justice, and and by doing that. We, we're putting the ethos business model out loud because if you'd have come to us in 2022 we'd have given you a month some money you know, there's been a project that we would have hired you and we'd have got you to work on your pet project and it may have worked may not have worked and you know that's what we've been doing for 15 years young leaders came along and we we thought no we need to stop this because we're we're focusing inward too much we need to, this needs to be an open innovation platform without um it, it being a process it's got to be a one person talking about social value how what it means to them in order for them their self-interest to be furthered uh through you know putting social justice first that is quite a um it's quite cool actually it's it's quite um it's different it is not a 
it's not an established platform business model or a you know this is what our value pro no you are the commons as much as i am because we don't want to take ownership of this or the platform or anything else uh, but we do want to recognize everybody's got a legitimate self-interest um organization individually could i maybe add just a sort of nuance of that of that uh, ironically mm -hmm. yes i you, you cited i may not be in education but actually having been working with the dnt association for <laughs> a good couple of years now i'm primary engineer um and winning an award on communicating these things mark and me have actually just been dming on linkedin just now and saying <laughs> you should definitely meet up. and and it's actually very much despite me sounding like it's very self-interest the self-interest it also is also me feeling i'm a value to other people so so i also would say if there's a way to sort of create some sort of baseball cards that we understand what i can also help other people with that that is also rewarding and meaningful to me so um I, I always feel it's a problem with all these platforms that you know we we tend to put up cvs of ourselves but that doesn't tell you what's going on inside people's heads and and, and i, lo I love the analogy of a baseball card you know the Oh yeah. trading cards the you know the thing is like you know i've got a, i've got a special power Called autism yeah. level five thousand. Here we go. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's why I'm very drawn to 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 to, to your organisation and your you know by, by association of that the type of people you as it were collect. Um, so, so yeah, I, I see this as a, a two way street. I hope that's my clear. panini sticker book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, right. Conscious. It's thirteen oh two. Any more? support help by the way in terms of what next what next um before we stop recording until the next time well i i would say of course rob's talked about the commons that the space that we've created it's brand new we're learning we're in there there's i don't know 10 people now convened some whom we know some of whom we don't so if you haven't already joined join because we can talk between I and mean, we can talk anywhere you can talk on you know there's it's no like one, one click well, you commons, know, communicate wherever you need to communicate but, yeah, yeah yeah that that is and it's very open it's an open space um is what i would say and anybody on this here who hasn't been a podcast guest thank you mark thank you catherine you are welcome to come on the podcast and share your story anytime um please do <laughs> yeah, it would be lovely to hear everybody's stories. Have a look through the podcast we've done. That is a very individual centric and it's a, just a way to broadcast your story and, and like a record job. collection. It is like the, <laughs> the baseball card Jude that the when we when we the reason we're working out loud is we're not trying to sensationally, you know, do a love island. Um, we're trying <laughs> to build a record collection. You know, it's like Rob's record collection of, you know, every story in the world. They're all as important as each other. And uh, I treasure every every recording that we've got. And this one, the first, come back in 26 episodes and see see how we've grown. <laughs>